Good afternoon, everyone. It is a lovely afternoon. It's a little bit warm in here, but that's because it's so warm, unseasonably warm outside. Welcome or welcome back to Georgetown. My name is Artemis Kirk, university librarian, and it's a great pleasure to have you all with us. I see many familiar library associates faces, members of the faculty, some students, some invited guests, and we're very, very pleased that you could be here today to have uh, an introduction to and hear from Mr. Alexander Waugh, grandson of the novelist Evelyn Waugh, and an accomplished author and um, very talented person in a number of areas in his own right. Some of you may know that Evelyn Waugh visited Georgetown University, but a bit before our time, in 1949. Since then, the library has accrued a quite extensive collection of his writings, both personal and professional, which our Director of Special Collections, John Buchtel, will probably discuss in greater depth. The Library Associates also hosted a symposium on Yves Lenoir on the occasion of his centennial in 2003. We're very pleased that the relationship we think we have with the Wa generations continues to this day. The collection of Yves Lenoir that we have is just one of the many treasures we have in the Library's Special Collections Research Center, and I believe many of you have seen this wonderful book that highlights some of these collections. Special Collections at Georgetown is a terribly important initiative, and we like to think that we have one of the finest collections of special collection resources for a university our size just about anywhere. So it's a great source of pride for us. A program like this is actually something that we do through our uh, donations from the Library Associates, and you will have heard me say before, and I will say it again, if you're not yet a member of the Georgetown Library Associates and would like to become one, we would welcome your interest. I believe Miriam Nickerson, our Director of Development, is waving her hand at the back of the room, and I know she'd be very happy to talk to you about membership. You also may know that the university is embarking upon a campaign for Georgetown entitled For Generations to Come. And to some degree, the generations represented in special collections are emblematic of the library's involvement in our campaign, and we would welcome your interest in that as well. So before we proceed, I want to say thank you to a number of people who have made or are making this event possible. Among them, members of the staff, Jessica Pierce, Jenny Smith, Alyssa Skyrick, and all of the other staff members who have worked hard on all of this. Our indefatigable people from media, Barrington Baines, our videographer, and David Hagen, our photographer, are here as well. But I also want to welcome and thank a couple of other people. Of course, our speaker, Alexander Waugh, and to our special collections manuscripts librarian, Nicholas Sheets, who is in the back, for his role in having Mr. Waugh join us. I'd like to introduce you to Ambassador Salva Lucky Roosevelt, who is on the member of the library board, who actually had donated a number of materials to us from her personal collections, but they included materials from Oberon Waugh, and she has just given to John Buchtel several other items personally inscribed to her by Alexander Waugh's father. Son. son. No, he is oh, the son. Okay. No, Oberon was the father, <laughs> the last I looked. Um, also, I'd like to introduce you to John McGinty, who is the librarian from Loyola Marymount University. John McGinty was the place, uh, no, John no, wasn't, Loyola, Maryland, just hosted Alexander Waugh last week, and we're very pleased that John could join us here today. And last but not least, I would like to introduce to you Sam Radin, who is here from New York. Sam is an eminent Evelyn Waugh collector, uh, specialist, and actually friend of Georgetown. And Sam Radin very kindly loaned to Georgetown a number of works from his personal collection on Evelyn Waugh when we had the Waugh Symposium in 2003. So we're very pleased you could all be with us, and we're very grateful for all you've done for us. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. John Buchtel, who is the head of the Special Collections Research Center, where he manages our collection of rare books manuscripts, fine art, and the uni university archives. John came to Georgetown in 2008 from Johns Hopkins University. He has a PhD in English from the University of Virginia and teaches an introductory survey course on the history of the book, 
200 to 2,000 at the Rare Book School based at the University of Virginia. Welcome, John. Thank you, Artemis. Thank you, everyone, for coming out this afternoon on the, uh, this beautiful day. I want first uh, to thank Mrs. Roosevelt for her gift of four Oberon Waugh books. This one is inscribed, this is the Path of Dalliance. For Lucky, from her um, uh, greatest admirer, C.P. Snow, oh, that's crossed out. <laughs> Dr. Strangelove, oh, that's crossed out too. Oberon Waugh. <laughs> Thank you, Lucky. Georgetown has a long history of collecting and studying the works of Anglo-Catholic literary figures. The library has for many years maintained a special interest in the works of Evelyn Waugh. Special Collections has pulled together dozens of first, early, and significant editions of his works, and even more impressively, more than 500 of his letters and other relevant materials, including the papers of Waugh's biographer, Christopher Sykes. The letters attest to the intricate network of relationships that writers like Waugh participated in there are letters to his close friend, Lady Mary Ligon, to bookseller Handicide Buchanan, and to Leonard Russell, the editor of the Sunday Times, as well as in the papers of Douglas Woodruff, the longtime editor of The Tablet, novelist Bruce Marshall, and perhaps most notably for Georgetown, since they speak to Waugh's relationship with another figure we collect comprehensively in our Graham Greene collection. This afternoon, we are extremely pleased to welcome Evelyn Waugh's grandson and journalist Ober Oberon Waugh's son, Alexander Waugh. After reading music at Manchester University, he worked as an impresario and concert agent. As a classical record producer, he has been responsible for a host of prize-winning discs, including five MRA awards and a French Grand Prix du Disque. As a publisher, his innovative fold-up Travelman short stories won a Design Council Millennium Award. He was the chief opera critic of The Mail on Sunday, 1990 to 91, and The Evening Standard, 91 to 96, and has written many books on music, including Classical Music, A New Way of Listening, which has been translated into 14 foreign languages. He reviews books regularly for most of the major British newspapers and has contributed cartoons to the Literary Review and the Daily Telegraph. His books, Time and God, were published to worldwide critical acclaim, while his best-selling Fathers and Sons, a portrait of the male relations in his own family, was made into a documentary film by BBC Four in 2005. In 2006, he presented another documentary called The Piano, A Love Affair, also with BBC Four. His musical Bon Voyage, co-written with his brother Nathaniel, won the 12th Vivian Ellis Award for Best New Musical. In 2008, he published his best-known book, the House, the House of Wittgenstein, A Family at War, about the one-armed pianist Paul Wittgenstein and his philosopher brother Ludwig. He is currently editing 42 volumes of the complete works of Evelyn Waugh for Oxford University Press, is a director of Millennium and Cockthorn Hotels PLC, and founder and chairman of Zebras Management Limited, an innovative new sit uh, system for auditing ebook sales. At the end of A Handful of Dust, Evelyn Waugh recounts the story of a character who is trapped in the jungles of South America, condemned to an endless reading and rereading of the novels of Charles Dickens. <laughs> Hopefully, I can get away with mentioning that metaphor for eternal punishment given that our current exhibition celebrates Dickens's 200th birthday. Those of us who travel in literary critical circles re might remember Harold Bloom's phrase to describe the sometimes vexing relationships that poets have with their predecessors, the anxiety of influence. One might worry that Alexander Waugh 
might suffer both from a kind of anxiety of influence and that he might feel himself condemned to perpetually be required to talk and talk again about his forebears. As we can see from that long list of accomplishments, we need not have worried. And we are most fortunate, too, that he doesn't mind talking about his forebears. We are pleased indeed to welcome Alexander Waugh to speak to us this afternoon about Evelyn Waugh and the question of inheritance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. It suddenly occurs to me that I never asked anybody how long you wanted me to speak for. Um, would, you, would you care to just, shall I just see if you're getting a bit bored and stop, or, or what's, what, what's the idea? 30 or 40 minutes with questions. Oh, very quick. 30 or 40 minutes. I can easily give you 30 or 40 minutes about my grandfather. Um, I, in fact, it's going to be quite tight because there's so many things I could possibly say about him. Um, but I won't. That's absolutely fine. I'll, I'll, I'll do 30 or 40 minutes. Um, I'll explain to you also that I'm partly here to look at this beautiful library that I've been examining um, because of the 42 volumes that were described, complete works of, um, of Evelyn War. In fact, I've just been reading a letter which said what a terrible shit my father was. So it's very nice <laughs> uh, to see that some people don't, don't seem to think that. Um, and then I've come out of these papers, which I've been studying for about three hours in there, and I'm going to come tomorrow morning, very, rather dazed. A bit like one sometimes is when you come out of a cinema, you know, and you've seen, gone in and it's daylight and you've seen a very intoxicating film and, and you come out and it's suddenly darkness and you just don't know where you are or, or what's going on. But it's a beautiful place and I'm glad to be here and I've got a vague idea I'm somewhere in Washington. Thank you for having me. Um, I will explain to you very briefly uh, my relationship with Evelyn Waugh. Um, you know that I'm his grandson and I can dispense with the, the part of the story in which I knew him very, very quickly indeed, because um, I have no memory of that. Um, I, I was born in 1963, December 1963, and he died in April, Easter Sunday, 1966. So in fact, I was two and a half. I have a couple of photographs where I'm sitting upon his knee, and he's wrestling to have control of me with my father. Um, I'm looking pleased to be in neither of their clutches, I have to say. Um, I have a signed copy of his last book, A Little Learning, which he dedicated to his four existing grandchildren at that moment, and he's inscribed it to me, not particularly interestingly, just says from your affectionate grandfather, Evelyn. I had a very nice silver cup, uh, which had a coat of arms stamped upon it. He, he, he was a little bit snobbish, as it may have come to some of your attention, this. Uh, and he got very, very excited when he discovered that I uh, was allowed to have 16 little pictures. If, if you drew, drew a shield, I could have 16 little quarterings upon it. He couldn't, um, nor could my father, and nor, in fact, can the Duke of Devonshire. Um, <laughs> well, he can't, you see, because his, his mother was an American, so that wrecked everything. The thing is, you can't, you can't backdate these coats of arms, so what you can do is you can draw a shield and then divide it into two, which would be your, your father's family's coat of arms, and on the other side you can put your mother's. And uh, then if you, you can divide it into four if your grandparents all have it, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you can't. It's not something you can buy or backdate. Um, so, so to have 16, it really excited him. It's called an armorial achievement. So this very, very pretty cup, which had passed from male war to male war for five or six generations, and very modestly inscribed from um, Nathaniel War to Alexander War to Evelyn War or whatever, suddenly was emblazoned with this um, huge pattern, which were all my um, my forebears coats of arms. Anyway, that lasted all of about uh, 18 years in my possession, because then I went um, to show it to someone and it got stolen, so that was the end of that. So th those really are, the, uh, uh, are my connections of, of knowing him. And of course I knew many, many people who knew him, but then my connection with him really becomes quite distant. My first memory of being aware that I was a grandson of such an important writer was when I was about four and a half years old and went to school for the very first time, very first day, and I refused to sit down. And I think it's quite common that, actually. Children refuse to sit down at their first day of school, and I just wouldn't, and they kept putting me down, and I kept bouncing up again. And the, um, the headmaster thought that somehow it would work if he produced a penguin book and held it up to the class and said, this, this jack-in-the-box who won't sit down, he is the grandson of the man who wrote this book. And I, that didn't mean anything to me. I looked up at the, at the Penguin book. It didn't obviously meant nothing to the, 
to the children in the class either. But it was my first awareness that there was something interesting going on to do with books. Um, and then it, I suppose it wasn't really till I was about 15 or 16 that I started reading Evelyn War uh, with great pleasure, but mainly, I think, looking for the jokes. And my father, my, my father always used to say that um, Evelyn Moore never opened his mouth but to, to make a good joke. And humor was a great part of the, of, of the household. Um, in fact, I've brought up my children to believe that seriousness is a form of stupidity. <laughs> uh, it could be dangerous, this, but uh, my children are too young to notice whether this experiment is going to end in some terrible collision further down the line. But they believe it for the time being. Um, I think it's based on something a bit more sensible than it sounds. It's based on the idea that the world is such a topsy-turvy, incongruous, crazy place that to say something as a sort of solid statement from a, from a solid concrete plinth is, is to be rather foolish because there's nothing you can really say that is actually true and makes any real sense. But by making jokes, you're, um, you're really highlighting the essential point that, that everything's uh, crazy. So making jokes, I think, is a form of intelligence. Having said that, I haven't made any yet, so you're probably wondering what the hell's going on. Um, so I read these books, and I thought um, to myself, yes, they did contain uh, wonderful jokes. And it wasn't until quite some time later that I started to appreciate the reasons why everybody else said that Evelyn Moore was a really great writer. Because it wasn't just the jokes, although they're often supreme. But I think it's the way he expressed them and the way he wrote it's so clear, and there's never, a, there's never a word that's wasted. There's never any bit that you could sort of shear off and say, well, it'd be better if you had dropped that, that bit. And the juxtaposition of ideas is often very surprising and very beautiful. And that he's known as a satirist. I don't think, actually, it was the word that he particularly liked applied to himself, satire. Um, and I think people sometimes confuse satire with, with, with a sort of sneering. I don't sense any sneering in Evelyn Moore, actually. Um, but what I do sense is a great deal of surprise. So he went round the world very wide-eyed and saw these people doing things that surprised him, that he thought were absolutely bizarre and absurd. And he wrote it down in very, very clear in English. And he wasn't afraid of the things that some novelists think won't work, like um, coincidences. I mean, life is full of them. And then they go in, into the book, the same person coming round in a different guise time and again. Um, in, in this way, I think um, his works are very true. And if anyone asks me uh, which book of Evelyn Moore to recommend to start off with, I give a ponderous and very dull answer, uh, which is read them all, and read them all in order. Because actually, I can think of very few novelists. I mean, you might all shout Zola or someone to me, or Anthony Pohl. Um, but I can think of few novelists, really, whose a, a complete work, if read in order, forms such a, a, a logical path uh, and such a, um, a compulsive canon. Um, so I really would start at Decline and Fall and work your way right through to the end of the War Trilogy, because there you'll see not only the same characters come in, but the different ideas. You can see the mind working with, with ideas and sometimes tossing them out and sometimes um, enriching them and, and culturing them and turning them into something else. Um, so, as I said, as a, as a young person, it was the, it was the sh sheer joy of the jokes. Um, I'll give you an example of one that I, I just remember. Uh, I was 15 and roaring with laughter then and happiness over it. And, and I look at it again, and it still makes me very, very pleased indeed. Lots of people, lots of writers have attempted to deal with the question of, uh, of a hangover. Um, and I'm sure you all have your favorites from mm -hmm. um, uh, a Tom Wolfe to Tom. They were often called Tom, aren't they? Tom Sharp was very good at hangovers. Um, famous hangover man, of course, was Kingsley Amis, who famously wrote one, one greatly brilliant hangover scene. But to me, none quite beats this one. And it comes from vile bodies. And uh, the young man finds himself waking up with a hangover in a hotel. And the waiter has just bought him for breakfast a plate of kippers. <coughs> the waiter stood about, fingering the brass knobs at the end of the bed, smiling ingratiatingly. Then he produced a gardenia, slightly browned at the edges. He had found, in it an evening, he'd found it in an evening coat he had just been brushing. Would Signor perhaps like a buttonhole? No, said Adam. Go away, for he had a headache. The waiter sighed deeply and walked with pettish steps to the door. Adam ate some breakfast. No kipper, he reflected, is ever as good as it smells. 
How this too earthly contact with flesh and bones spoilt the first happy exhilaration. If only one could live as Jehovah was said to have done on the savour of burnt offerings. He lay back for a little in his bed thinking about the smells of food, of the greasy horror of fried fish and the deeply moving smell that came from it, of the intoxicating breath of bakeries and the dullness of buns. He planned dinners for enchanting aromatic foods that should be carried under the nose, snuffed and thrown to the dogs. Endless dinners in which one could alternate flavour with flavour from sunset to dawn without satiety, while one breathed great draughts of the bouquet of old brandy. Oh, for the wings of a dove, thought Adam, wandering a little from the point as he fell asleep again. <laughs> um, another, I'll read one, one other very delightful little, little passage which... I love so much and always gives me pleasure, but I think shows the, the, the depth that Evelyn Moore can reach from very, very simple and very short passage. I think one of the things that is great about Evelyn Moore as a writer is that you can take quite often just two paragraphs and, and any other novelist would, would, would think you can write a book out of it. But he's so rich in his observation and so concise that he can just squeeze it down into a simple paragraph. Here's one such example comes from Brideshead, revisited, uh, when the girl, Julia, aristocratic, uh, wants to get married to a very vulgar Canadian, a sort of man who believes that uh, any problem uh, can be fixed just by throwing money at it. And there are several problems with his attempted wish to marry this lady. She's a Catholic English aristocrat. Uh, he is neither aristocrat nor Catholic and has previously been married. So that the family is obviously extremely tense and apprehensive. Uh, about the arrival of this person and hasn't quite brought itself to discuss the issue. At luncheon, Julia had no thoughts except for her guest who was coming that day. She drove to the station to meet him and brought him home to tea. Mummy, do look what, at Rex's Christmas present. It was a small tortoise with Julia's initials set in diamonds in the living shell and this slightly obscene object, now slipping impotently on the polished boards, now striding, striding across the card table, now lumbering over a rug, now withdrawn at a touch, now stretching its neck and swaying its withered antediluvian head, became a memorable part of the evening, one of those needle hooks of experience which catch the attention when larger matters are at stake. Dear me, said Lady Marchmain, I wonder if it eats the same sort of things as an ordinary tortoise. <laughs> what will you do when it's dead, asked Mr. Samgrass. Can you have another tortoise fitted into the shell? <laughs> that sense of inability to face issues, to discuss things with one another, to look one another in the eye and to just be distracted by something as grotesque as a tortoise with a lot of diamonds stuck in its shell. So much is said in that very short, very short bit. And I think that, in, in a way, is the essence of the genius of Evelyn Waugh. Um, so that I read these books, and then I thought they were quite good, and then went on to other things, some of which have been very eloquently described by John there. Um, but I've now returned to Evelyn War. One of the things that happened is my father died, and so I wrote a book called Fathers and Sons, which actually examined the relationship of the fathers and sons over five generations in the family. Um, it, I, was, I was remarkably lucky with that book, um, and I can say this without without even boasting, because it's a fact, and I don't think you can boast of facts of facts, can you? I think boasts have to have, a, have, a, have an element of fiction thrown in. But I think it's a fact that uh, the, the archival record uh, relating to the father-son relationships in my family over five generations is the, the biggest, most extensive, the only one in the world. I don't, I don't, in short, I don't believe another family in the whole world could produce the archival, uh, the archival evidence of the relationship of father and son over five generations to the extent that the wars did. Why? Well, they were all writers for a start. So, so my father, um, my father's father, Evelyn War, his brother, Alec War, his father, Arthur War, they all wrote autobiographies to kick off with, so that they're all writing about each other in that before we go anywhere further. Evelyn War um, famously detested the telephone and wouldn't have anything to do with it, so everything had to be put in writing. Um, I found something, shall I, shall I just go slightly sideways a minute? I found quite an interesting piece of evidence which I at last didn't have when I wrote Fathers and Sons. My father accidentally shot himself in Cyprus. Um, 
I, I won't go into the details of how he did it, but it wasn't a suicide attempt. He was asking about, and so was somebody else who he covered for, but he was trying to mend a gun, essentially, and it went off. He was doing his military service, and he very nearly died, and he was 18 years old. And uh, the War Office, knowing that Evelyn War was a famous man, thought that the newspapers would get hold of this thing, and it would all be splashed in the papers um, before his father, Evelyn War, or mother, um, had been told about this terrible accident, and he might be dead by then. So the War Office sent a message uh, back to England to say this awful thing had happened, and someone called Sir Alan Lennox Boyd went rushing into a cabinet meeting with the Prime Minister, who then must have been Macmillan, I suppose, and said, great problem, we've got to get hold of Evelyn War and tell her of this. Macmillan, who knew a bit about Evelyn War, said there's a great problem with him because he doesn't answer the telephone. Um, so, but you're going to have to find his telephone number, and you're going to have to ring him up and tell him that this terrible accident's happened and his son might be going to die. And so the man went off, and he sent his junior, said, go find War's telephone number and, and do this job. And if there's any problem, we're told that the Prime Minister um, says that he's behind this and there's to be no messing. So first thing that happened is this man rang up Chapman and Hall, the publishers, said, can we have Evelyn Moore's telephone number? Can't tell you what it's about, it's very important. Of course, Chapman Hall said, no, he doesn't answer telephone calls, he certainly can't. And they said, the Prime Minister insists. So Chapman and Hall very reluctantly gave the telephone number. Then they rang up Coombe Flory House, where my grandfather was living, and Butler answered the telephone. Can we speak to Evelyn War? No, he doesn't like answering the telephone. No, but we must, we insist. No, no, he does, he's not interested in the telephone. Uh, the Prime Minister insists, to do with the Prime Minister. Very well, I shall go and get him. Clop, clop, clop on the floor, and back comes the same person with the same voice quite clearly. Yes, what is it, what do you want? Um, um, we're very sorry to inform you that your um, son has shot himself and uh, might possibly die in Cyprus. What a fool, he said. <laughs> Put down the telephone. Um, so that, anyway, that's a bit of an aside about telephones and why they don't work. Um, now, I haven't got long to tell you what I really want to tell you, because I think it's quite interesting. Um, what it's about is that after writing Fathers and Sons, my father was dead and I did that, and that was quite interesting. And then um, I've got deeper and deeper into this, this lark, to the extent where I've really become quite a sort of nerd, because I'm really so interested in it that has been, been explained. I'm now editing 42 volumes of the Oxford University Press, the complete works of Evelyn Moore. And that's, that's an edition that's going to have you know, all the bits he cut out of the manuscript, and basically everything he ever wrote, annotated, footnoted, uh, and I've got a staff of about 30 people working with me on it, and it might even expand from that, but it's a major project. I don't, I don't think uh, that there's ever been such a, a, a generous scholarly project for any 20th century novelist, but I, I may be wrong about that. But um, It's certainly a pretty massive, major, major thing. Um, so I'm editing, I'm editing that, so I really have become a, quite a bore. Um, and, and very fastidious and very minding about uh, every single date and issue that comes up. And one day, um, someone rang, the telephone rang, and I answered it, and it, it was a man I didn't know at all who said his name was Desmond, and would I care to have him to stay? And I didn't know what he looked like, but he would arrive at Taunton Station in a white coat, in a white suit, and I could pick him up from there. And I thought the sheer pluck and conceit and <laughs> extraordinariness of this man uh, deserved a yes answer, because I've never known anyone do that, really. His reason, he did give a tiny reason. I said, well, why do you want to come and stay with me? He said, um, uh, in eight, prior to 1800 or so, I had some relations who once owned the house at Coombe Flory that you're... Actually, my, I think my mother had even sold it by then. But anyway, some distant relation owned this house, and he wanted me to drive it to him and drive him around to some other houses where he thought some other cousins might have lived. Um, so anyway, I put down the telephone, and I told my wife, Eliza, who's the most delightful and unshockable and sweet-natured person, I said, you'll never believe this, but a man I've never met in my life uh, or spoken to since today just rang up and said he wants to come to stay, and I'm to meet him, and he's going to wear a white suit, and that's how I'll know it is he. And so I've said yes, because I couldn't believe he could be so impertinent, and he must get an award for that level of impertinence. <laughs> and she said, I quite understand, very interesting. Anyway, this, this, <laughs> mad, this mad caper, oddly enough, paid off. It paid, it paid richly, because the man said to me after about two days and having drunk at least a case of my best wine, he said, uh, do you know Baby Jungman? Well, no, I didn't know Baby Jungman. In fact, I would assume that Baby Jungman was dead. Who's Baby Jungman? Well, Baby Jungman was... Um, 
a, a young girl, part of something not sort of equivalent to what we now might call the it crowd, but in those days was called the bright young things. In fact, she rather started it off. And they were slightly friv frivolous, flappish, gamine people who went around London in the 1930s um, having silly fancy dress parties and drilling up Piccadilly and playing a lot of practical jokes and getting themselves into the newspapers. And the Guinness girls were part of that and lots of other slightly silly people. But what, what was quite interesting about Baby Jungman, or Theresa Jungman, she was called, was that my grandfather, as was quite well known, Evelyn Waugh had fallen in love with her from about the end of 1931 until about, um, let's say, the end of 1933. So what, you might say, um, lots of people fall in love with lots of people. But it, it was quite interesting because my grandfather had had a very bad marriage, which lasted 29 months, to someone called Evelyn Gardner. And it had all collapsed and was useless. And then he immediately after that converted to Catholicism. And one of the things that was said to him when he converted to Catholicism was you do realize uh, that you won't be able to marry again. Um, and he still wanted to be a Catholic regardless of that. And it wasn't, in fact, till about 1933 that he realized that there was such a thing as an annulment and there was a possibility that he could get married. Anyway, he set his heart on this person called uh, Baby Jungman. Now, as many of you will know, there have been quite a lot of biographies of Evelyn Waugh. Um, at least five big serious ones and each one of those people had attempted to talk to baby Jungman and she'd said no go away I'm not having I'm not having any discussion of, of Evelyn Waugh in fact Mark Amory who edited the book called the letters of Evelyn Waugh uh, wrote to her and I have his correspondence do you have any letters from Evelyn Waugh no I don't I burnt them all um, and even if I did have them I wouldn't let you see them which then I think it was that last little part, that last little sentence that prompted him to write again. Are you absolutely sure you don't have any letters? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I've burnt them all. Anyway, this very odd man in a white suit said, um, believe it or not, baby Jungman is still alive. It is odd to think that someone was still alive who had been proposed to in 1933. Um, but she was still alive. She'd been born, she was born actually in, I think, 1907. And at that time, she was 102, 103 years old and living in Ireland, but I was told that her, she was compass mentis enough. Uh, and he said, well, look, actually, she's quite a friend of mine, so why don't I ask her if she'll see you? And he, so the white-suited man went off and went back to Ireland, and then I got a telephone call, and the white suit, it was the white suit again, <laughs> not so much saying thank you for the stay, but saying, good news, baby young one wishes to see you, but she is 103, and you better get straight on the first aeroplane, because <laughs> she might very well be dead by the time you get here. So I did exactly that. I took an aeroplane to Dublin two days later and was driven to a place called Lee Slip Castle where she was living in a part of it. And, and I walked into the room and there was this uh, quite pure-faced, round, small, clearly very, very old lady. And I sat by her and I said, you might remember that you agreed to see me and I'm Alexander War, I'm Evelyn War's grandson. No, no, she knew exactly who I was, that's quite all right. Very nice to see you. She was extremely formal and very polite. And so I started a sort of um, interview process with her and said, so do you remember much of Evelyn? Yes, I remember him very clearly. <laughs> Pause, not much coming there. OK, well, uh, uh, when did you last see him? I saw him in 1942. <laughs> Um, and I started asking questions, and then I was getting quite formal, straight answers, uh, but nothing, nothing terribly useful was coming out of her. I tried to sort of prompt her mind by asking about other people around in that circle. Randolph Churchill, for instance, Winston Churchill's son. You remember Randolph Churchill? Well, yes, I remember him. Um, <laughs> and? Um, <laughs> I asked her, I said to her, so, uh, you know, my grandfather was in love with you. Why, why, why didn't you marry him? Not my type, you know. <laughs> um, so it was all a bit frustrating and nothing really working, but I suppose it was fun to see her. And then I said to her, you don't by any chance have any... You want to ask me if I have any letters? Well, yes, actually. I was going to ask you that, thinking that the answer... I'd already seen Mark Amory, said so he'd ripped them all up. Ah, go into my bedroom next door, and on the bedside table there's a big multicoloured basket, and bring it through here. So I went through, and I went with this basket, and I got it. And I opened it up, and there's what seemed like 180 letters, never been seen by anyone before, uh, to her. And, and I just picked up the top one from the pile and started reading it. 
Thank you so much for coming to see me off. I'm afraid it was a dreary journey. Don't think that I wasn't grateful, just feeling so low-spirited. I could have cried at any moment. I wanted very much to kiss you goodbye, but didn't have the heart to risk, couldn't quite read that word, another escape. All my love, darling, Evelyn. I love you so much. Please don't be too deeply ashamed of me. I am a low character, but the one part of me that is at all valuable belongs to you. This, to anyone who's read Evelyn Waugh, will be most surprised to hear this way of talking from Evelyn Waugh. And one thing he's quite famous for is, is actually standing aloof, or at least standing back from, from an emotional thing and just observing with, with razor eyes. We don't expect him to be in the thick of this type of emotional thing. And, and so I read those two, and, and I was really excited now, because by this stage I was quite a boffin on the Evelyn Waugh material and knew an awful lot about it and this was a, a revelation and I could see there was a whopping great pile more to come. And as I was reading this and thinking this is the most interesting thing ever, the old lady started started piping up. Oh yes, and Randolph Church was very interesting. I remember I went to this party and I, and I, I was looking here and suddenly she was off. She was up and she was away and my, my whole mind was being split in twain because I wanted to, to do this and I knew she were, I, I had to have this as well. And, um, panic set into my heart and um, and I said to her oh look um, this is difficult for me but um, you, you wouldn't by any chance interrupting me again I know what you're going to ask me make photocopies of them well yes they're over there on the side I've done them for you already so it was a wonderful thing and then I was able to take them away and I read them all night these letters and anyway nobody nobody has has read them um, I, I, I read a few chunks of them um, to a conference at um, just last week uh, in, in, in Baltimore and I read a few chunks also at the Redwood Library but otherwise nobody's, nobody, nobody's heard them, none of them have been published, no Evelyn Moore scholars know anything about them and, and it's very interesting. So with the little time I may have remaining I thought you might be interested if I just read a few um, snippets from some of these, these letters because I think they are they are very, very extraordinary, and they, they show a whole different side. Um, now, the other the thing that is worth bearing in mind is that she didn't really, she didn't really reciprocate this great love. Um, so it's a rather painful one-way one -way arrangement going on here. And lots and lots of other people fell in love with her. There was um, Lord Longford fell in love with her. Um, a man left her all, all, she didn't have much money, but a man left her a great estate in Sussex who, who fell in love with her. And, and so on and so forth. And I'll tell you a bit about someone else th who fell in love with her, which is why it all gets a bit, a bit painful, this story. But I'll tell you that in a minute. First of all, here's a very, un very, very unlikely letter from the pen of Evelyn Waugh. Sweet Tess, I don't think of much except you, your beauty so fragile and intangible, a thing of fresh water and early morning, and the silence of dawn and mists just alloyed with gold and deep saturated restful greens, like sunrise on that river I travelled down last winter, and your intricate character, all mystery and frustration, a labyrinth with something infinitely secret and infinitely precious at its centre. And sometimes I see you as a sick child in a hospital cot, but I dare say you want to be thought of like that. I don't understand anyone less and want anyone more or paradoxically feel more confident in my power of eventually, a long way ahead, becoming you and joining you so that instead of two fragments of people, we both become something different and single. I don't care how long I wait or how many painful things happen, only I want your patience when I make mistakes and love enough to forgive them. Darling Tess, your beauty is all around me like a veil so that every moment apart from you seems obscure and half real. I look on the next weeks with foreboding, not just of loneliness, because I have been used to that, but of drabness and ineffectiveness, for nothing apart from you seems worth being awake for. Think well of yourself, my darling, E. Now, then, you, you, if you, to put this in the perspective of the time of what was actually happening to Evelyn War at that moment, he had just published um, his first novel, uh, Decline and Fall, and his second novel was suddenly a massive success, uh, which was uh, Vile Bodies, which I read to you a little bit from. 
And um, his third novel, Black Mischief, was just out. He was about to work on Handful of Dust. And he was um, in England, not, not so much in America at that point, but in England he was an extremely famous novelist. He was the one all the papers were talking about the whole time. And he was a sort of man about town and was being celebrated in the salons of um, Emerald Cunard and meeting lots of famous people, being introduced to famous people. Um, but none of this uh, worked very well on ba Baby Jungman. She wasn't, she wasn't impressed by any of that. She wasn't interested. Um, and at the beginning of 1932, um, a play was made out of Vile Bodies, which showed um, in the West End of London. It was talk of, uh, talk, of, talk of the town because it was originally been banned by the Lord Chancellor for being too disgusting and risque. So when at last it came on, everybody rushed to see it. Uh, and Evelyn, obviously very keen that baby Jungman should come to see it with him, but um, she went off to Ireland. Darling Tess, you must be missing me, but cheer up, these separations are the very manure of love. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I, know you must, I know you must be almost mad with anxiety to hear about my play. Well, I don't know, everyone laughed very loud and the criticisms this morning seem pretty genial, but no one can tell whether it will be a success yet. I found a huge sheaf of telegrams of good wishes from everyone I'd ever met, from Jim Lawrence to Gertrude Lawrence, but was there one from Teresa? And did I tear them open with trembling hands, looking in vain for one loved name without which all success must be failure? And was I surprised at its absence? Not on your life, old girl. So I met a common man with gold teeth called Fruity, and he said he was going to Ireland to see the horse race. So if you see him, you can buttonhole him and ask him about the play. What have I done in the black days since you went away? Well, I have dined with Emerald and lunched with Emerald and sat on her right hand, but was my head turned by this blaze of glory? No, I remained the simple, unspoilt child you learnt to love, and I spent an evening with a pregnant relative of yours and one who had a fortune teller come baby come f bacon fat party and a young lady called Patsy Ward, and I lunched with Irene and dined with old Louisa Shannon. I saw your mamma at the Ritz, and who do you think she was lunching with? Why, Dick, of course. And today I'm lunching with Mrs. Corrie, and you will say, my God, poor Evelyn's getting into bad company with me away. Well, what do you expect? Non sum qualis eram boni sub regno sinari. And you can't tell what that means, because it's in Latin, and it takes a girl of education like Mrs. Packenham, whom God preserved, to understand that. So today I go off to the country to finish a novel I was writing, and you would like to know the address. It is the Eastern Court Hotel Chagford. But why in God's name should you, E? <laughs> he sends her a copy of Black Mischief as soon as it comes out, and, and he keeps sending her presents and giving her things, and still feeling that the relationship isn't precisely what one calls a two-way relationship. I sent you a copy of my book this morning, the one you've read because I want you to see the frontispiece, which is funny. Then I thought, how boring that the last two or three times you've written, it has been to say thank you for something. So I rang up to say that you weren't to answer, that I sent you the book simply to show you that I was still thinking of you. But I spoke to your mother instead. And then I thought how, some time back, you wrote offering your friendship and how that was a better present than black mischief or a rosary or even a school for horse and rider, and how churlish it was of me not to say thank you. <laughs> Quite sweet and touching, really. Um, but things get less sweet and touching when, um, when he realises he's really getting nowhere with her, and it's exasperating him. And, and, and that the letters that he wants from her or craves from her simply don't give him any pleasure at all. Evelyn Moore was a wonderful letter writer. I mean, I'm, I am editing something like 12,000 of them, and I can tell you that there's only, the only bits I'm cutting out are when he gives directions to his house. You know, turn left at the second roundabout and, kind of, and then you'll arrive at the house. It's the only time he's ever, ever boring. And, and he, the way he writes is the way he was told to write by his father. And I know this because he must have write, written quite a boring, bland letter to his father once when he was at school. And the father wrote to him and said, you pick up the pen and do it properly, and you imagine that the person that you're talking to is right in front of you, and you talk to them, not to anybody else. And, and you can see that in Evelyn Moore's letters, where, in fact, he, he tells the same anecdote to two or three correspondents, and it's very clear that he's talking directly to that each person because he'll tell it differently, in a different way to his own diary as well. Um, I, I, I got a note from you written on, a ch on the channel ship. 
I was glad to have your address, but don't think me disagreeable when I repeat that I just don't want letters from you. Let me know your movements and any change of address, but I forbid you to write another letter except in emergency. I told you this before you left. Now and then, when you are feeling strongly about anything, you can write exquisitely, but your ordinary letters are so charmless and empty that it is only boring and disappointing to get them. They might have been written to Miss Mossop. It is no wonder that you cannot bother to finish them. This sounds berating, but it isn't really. It is just that I want to save myself unnecessary disappointment. I don't expect you to be any different from what you are. I quite understand that lots of people become impersonal when they take hold of a pen. The telephone has exactly that effect upon me. Um, she obviously writes back quite cross about that letter, that her letter's lost, um, and he comes with a second one on that point. A letter from you this morning, which makes me wish I had not written quite as I did last time. I still won't have you writing to me, but wish I had said it differently. Darling, there is no question of my being cross or your being inadequate. I love you, and that's all there is to it. And I know you a little, and so realize that you, could, that you find it hard to do both the bad and the good things that come easily to less remarkable people. You have almost every lovely quality, tolerance, temperance, patience, family affection, discretion, reticence, purity, all unattainable to me. But you're also lazy, cold, and undecided. <laughs> I know all that. I knew all that long before I really fell in love with you. There's no reproach anywhere except to me for arrogance in thinking I can make you love me, and I still think that. And any rebuff I get is well deserved. So don't let's get in a muddle about that. Only don't write any more unless there's something you have to say. And I don't see there can be, so don't write. <laughs> Eventually, uh, his Catholic divorce, that's to say his um, annulment, comes through and he goes straight to baby Youngman and says, right, will you marry me? And she says, no. And he's bitterly disappointed, to say the least, and goes off to write what many believe to be his masterpiece, which is A Handful of Dust, and he goes to Morocco to do that. Darling Tess, you will say it was sly to go away without saying anything. I meant to tell you that evening at the Savoy, but when it came to the point, I didn't want to spoil a pleasant evening. Not heaven knows that I'm like Lord David and think you will be broken-hearted at being left, but because I shouldn't be able to trust myself not to be embarrassing about it. You see, it would be affected to pretend I have any reason except you for going away. But please believe it isn't only selfish, running away from pain, though it has been more painful than you know all the last months, realizing every day that I was becoming less attractive and less important to you. But also, I can't be any good to you without your love, and it's the worst possible thing for you to have to cope with the situation that had come about between us. If you're inclined to think too bitterly about my behavior in the summer, please remember this, that for all the first part, when you say you liked me, I was not allowed any expression at all of my love. It isn't surprising if I was sometimes jealous and quarrelsome and ill at ease in your house. One loving gesture would have <coughs> I'm so sorry, taken all the nonsense out of me and made me humble and gentle. But that didn't come until one evening at Cuckoo Weir, and by that time I had quarrelled with your mother, and it was not to be expected that you would last out alone for long. Then everything else... Everything seemed beautiful until the stab in the back from cows, and since then, everything has been worse and worse until you couldn't even bring yourself to kiss me or take a decent present without feeling ashamed of it. That day, I went straight off and booked my passage. I wonder if this letter is legible. Best not, perhaps. Evelyn. Uh, and then, you see, when uh, many years later, a little boy, who was a f uh, his mother was a friend of Evelyn's, said to him, rather, rather pleased to be talking to a famous writer. He said, what, what's the most difficult thing you ever did as a writer? And Evelyn Moore said, turning uh, a, a woman into a man. He actually said to Christopher Sykes, um, the, quite an interesting point that I don't think is in this library, but I found it because I'm such a nerd. I found it by combing through the uh, corrected typescript of Christopher Sykes's autobiography, a passage he had crossed out saying he had had a conversation with Evelyn Moore where he said that every single character in Evelyn Moore's Handful of Dust was based on Baby Youngman. 
so obsessed was he mm. with her then. Um, so what happened? I'll just quickly round off and end the speech because I think we're going on. Okay, so what did in fact happen? Well, I'll tell you what happened is uh, Baby Youngman married a fellow in the Canadian Army. Yes, indeed. Um, that takes us back to the, to the diamond-studded tortoise shell. And Julia, I think, is very much, in many ways, based upon, um, uh, based upon Baby Youngman, who was extremely Catholic and put up many obstacles uh, to Evelyn based upon her Catholicism. It's rather why Evelyn believed that when he got his annulment, she would say yes and marry him, but she didn't anyway. Um, so it was quite a long time later, it was in, 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 in the war, by which stage Evelyn had found happiness because he had married my grandmother and already, I think, had two children, certainly my father and, um, and my Aunt Teresa, who now lives in America. And he discovered, of, um, exactly, Teresa. An interesting point, that, actually. Uh, his first daughter was called Teresa. We're told that she was called Teresa after Maria Teresa, who was the Empress of Austria, because she was born on the day of Anschluss. But it is odd to choose the, the name Teresa. Um, it's also interesting that Aunt Teresa is the goddaughter of Teresa Jungmann, and that Teresa Jungmann later had a child um, who is Evelyn's goddaughter, who's still alive, called um, Teresa, uh, called Penelope Cuthbertson. And some of you may know what she looks like naked if you're um, fans of Lucian Freud's paintings. Um, so he discovers that she's got married. I have not been on leave. This is written in uh, 1st of August, 1940, in the last letter. Um, I have not been on leave in London, nor met anyone who knew us for so long that I did not hear until yesterday the news of your marriage. I congratulate your husband with all my heart. Did I meet him among your Canadian guests? Anyway, I long to meet him again. He must be a prodigy to have triumphed where so many have fallen. Um, a generous remark, but actually um, a remark that went even further wrong. That marriage didn't last very long. She had two children, the boy died early, and, and Penelope's still with us. Um, and then for the rest of her time, she lived alone, quite poor, until one of her great admirers left her a, 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 some large estates. Um, the last time she appears in, in, in Evelyn Waugh's diaries or letters or anything like that is when he goes in 1950 to stay at a house called Merriworth, which is owned by a man called Peter Beatty. And uh, it was a very, very depressing occasion. Uh, Teresa Jungman was staying there, but actually she, she had a lodge at the end of the drive. And Peter Beatty was very, very depressed. And Evelyn, it obviously affected Evelyn Moore very badly because he writes about it in quite a lot of letters to other people and in his diary, saying it was the most ghastly weekend because Peter Beatty was going around the house <coughs> looking completely mopey and hopeless. Um, one week later, Peter Beatty jumped out of a high window at the Ritz Hotel in London and killed himself. And it was generally said at the time that his eyesight was going. He was suffering from macular degeneration or one of those sorts of things. And he'd killed himself for fear of on onsetting blindness. Um, I met and befriended a member of the Beatty family, um, a close friend of mine, who introduced me to his mother, who was around at that time and knew. And I just mentioned Peter Beatty. And she said, oh, no, no. No, no, he didn't do nothing. He didn't kill himself because of blindness. He, he killed himself because of some woman called Teresa Jungman. Um, <laughs> And I said, oh, ooh. Uh, uh, he was desperately in love with Teresa Jungmann. And, and I think that explains uh, clearly what, what it was, the reason why Teresa Jungmann was absolutely refusing to let anyone look in on, on the Evelyn War world. Um, I think it was, it was a joke too far. I think she realized when Peter Beatty died, which is in the middle of 1950s, but that all these men had been in love with her time and time again, and that there was something frivolous about the way she dealt with it. And really, how she couldn't have spotted from these beautiful letters that Evelyn Moore wrote to her, but, but it, I don't think it was really until Peter Beatty killed himself that um, she realized quite how serious all this was, um, and that she probably hated herself uh, for having led so many, so many men up so many garden paths. And I think that was really the reason why she didn't want anyone to look into the Evelyn Moore letters or talk about Evelyn Moore. Um, and she did, she did last for another year and a half after seeing me, and then she, and then she died. Um, 
So that sort of brings me to the end of the story. Um, I, I, I could end with a few uh, remarks, more general remarks about Evelyn War. Um, I'll tell you how I ended at the Redwood. It didn't go down awfully well. In fact, it went down even worse when I did it at Loyola, so I'll definitely do it again. <laughs> I, I was talking there about Evelyn War and his great love of the truth. And he didn't understand lies, simply didn't understand them, it didn't mean anything to him. And so if you asked him a question, he would answer it. And sometimes his honesty got him into great trouble. You know, it's well known, for instance, that if he sat down at dinner um, and then his hostess would put him next to someone on his right and someone on his left, and if he didn't like the person on his right, he would shout across the table, why did you put me next to this appalling bore? I can't bear it. Um, and <laughs> I mean, and my father, um, my father tells a story of how he was uh, uh, introducing my mother. She wasn't my mother then because they, were, they weren't even engaged to be married, but he, his girlfriend, let's say, uh, introducing her for the first time to Kuhn Florian, to his parents. And obviously, as we all know, that's quite a nervous occasion. Uh, we very much hope that our parents will look kindly and favorably upon the people we've chosen to get married to. And so everyone was a little bit ner nervous, and Evelyn War was not in a terribly good mood. And um, they sat down to dinner, and conversation wasn't precisely flowing. And my father wanted to sort of kick, kick things and get kick, kick start things and get things going a bit. So he turned to his father and said, Papa, which is what he called him, Papa, do you like Penelope Betjeman? She's the, um, the wife of John Betjeman. And Evelyn turned sharply to him and said, if you're, asking, if you're asking me if I fucked her, the answer's yes. Um, I, I told you you might not like that. Uh, 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 it certainly went down very bad at Loyola College, uh, where they're even more Catholic than you are. Um, however, however, I, I bring up the point, not in order to shock you, but to make a much more simple point, that, that if everybody in the world were quite as honest and quite as straightforward and quite as remarkable as that, uh, the world would be a, a very hellish place in which to live. <laughs> but without a few people like Evelyn War, I think we can all admit uh, that it would be a duller, sicklier, more boring and depressing life that we're leading. Thank you. <laughs>
That's a good thing, but he wasn't actually, no. Uh, it was another um, aristocrat from Ireland, um, but this one called Desmond Fitzgerald, recently deceased. I think he died last year or something. Knight of Glynn is what he called himself. Um, he rang bells in Baltimore when I discussed them with him there because his son-in-law is a man called Dominic West, who acted a character called McNulty in a very famous program called The Wire, which is all set in Baltimore. Obviously means nothing to you in Washington, but it was a very, very famous <laughs> program. <laughs> very famous program in Baltimore. And he's called Knight of Glynn, he's just died, and he had a castle. Interesting, it was quite interesting in the sense that Coombe Flory House, where I was brought up where Evelyn Ward lived, was sold in 1802 by his distant ancestor. And with that money, they built this castle in Ireland. That was the sort of connection. And, and Desmond Fitzgerald also worked with Desmond Guinness on the Irish Georgian Society. That's how he knew them so well. Hello. Would your memories of the family archive permit you to write a portrait of your grandmother, Laura, since no war biography has written much or in much focus about her? She's a veiled character. Um, there's some, I think, American academic journal called Antigonish Review or something like that. And my father wrote, um, I think, a sort of eight-page essay on her for that, published in the 70s, sometime after she died. Um, I knew her very well for, for uh, whatever I was when, when she died, a nine-year-old, and loved her extravagantly because we both had um, a great love of cows. She, she was obsessed by cows almost more than anything else. It didn't matter to her that Brights had revisited, was dedicated to her, or that uh, this world of Evelyn Moore was dwelling around. Um, what she really liked to do was go into the field and get the cows in and squeeze their udders and get some milk out of it. Um, and I loved that as a boy, and we went to live at Coombe Flora, and I spent many, many, <coughs> many hours in the fields with her counting cows and looking at cows. I wish she hadn't died when I was nine, because there's so many things I'd love to ask her. Um, she was humorous, um, quite drunk. Um, she'd often say, I'll just have one, <laughs> one glass, and then get a, a sort of vase. <laughs> fill it up with sherry. Um, she had a very nice laugh, but it was a very uh, uh, cigarette, you know, a lot of roughness in that laugh because she smoked uh, Golwa's cigarettes and stank of Golwa's cigarettes, which I rather loved actually, and wore jerseys and held her trousers up with binder twine. She wasn't at all vain, uh, she wasn't at all fashionable, and she was not remotely impressed. Almost, you would say, all, all the opposite things from Evelyn Waugh, but I think their marriage was actually very, very happy. and long after they're married and long after they've had lots of children, the letters are so affectionate between them and uh, longing to see you and things like that. Um, so I think it was a rather touching marriage. She found happiness in that respect in the end. Yeah. Do you mean Granny? My, my, my grandma. Um, 1933, uh, another attempt to run away from baby Jungmann. Uh, he went on a cruise, sh on a cruise, a Catholic cruise along the Mediterranean and and there was the sister of my grandmother, my great-aunt Gabriel Drew. And she said, we have a very nice house, very smart house at Portofino. So why don't you get off the boat here and come and stay? And so he went to stay at Portofino, and there he saw this little, what he described her as a white mouse then, who was my grandmother. And then he was invited to stay at this big house called Pixton, which is the setting for Scoop, where Scoop is a boot bag normally. And, and then um, he just did what men do. <laughs> yes. Uh, in his letters to your grandmother during the war, he made it quite clear that he was bored with what she was telling him about the family and so forth. Yes. And I thought that was very cruel. Uh, did you get any response? Uh, no. In it, it, no. Other letters, did he, did he apologize or anything? I don't think that's cruel, and I, and I, and actually, it has echoes of what I've already. Mm -hmm. uh, the bit I read to you about don't send me letters, they're too right. cold, they're too... Uh, and about what his father told him about how to write letters. I, I don't think cruel, I think it was slightly uh, bossy and schoolmasterly. You know, if you want to write to me, do it this way, do it properly. That's what he's saying, is what he said to baby Youngman, and I think it's what he said to a few other people too. He certainly said it to my father, although I haven't still got that letter, that one's disappeared, but I've got my father's rather petulant reply. Uh, where he says, the flowers are in full bloom here in Cyprus. And then, you know, so clearly he'd been told to, <laughs> to put a bit more detail in his letters and do them properly. So I think uh, anyone who was used to Evelyn Moore, which his wife certainly was, and that wasn't a very early letter, that one, 
um, would would expect that. Um, and she was she was a lazy bones granny, a lovely person, but she was she was lazy and sloppy, and he was quite sort of regimental and wanted things done well, and and told her so. I don't think cruel, no. And I don't I don't believe she would have seen it as cruel either. Yes. When was your father in Cyprus? Um, no, Nineteen fifty-eight. Would it have been? Um, is that right? Um, Fifty-seven, fifty-eight. There was, there was, um, the British were there Very to the try and keep peace between Ayoka or something, the terrorists, and the, um, and yes, he was eighteen years old when he shot himself. Very, very nearly died. That's a whole other story. And I, I put a bit about that in the Fathers and Sons book. Anyone else have anything? Are yes. you still living at Conflore? No, last no. My my mother sold it in two thousand and eight, and I live about five miles from there. Did you did you go there? You, yes, you did. I yes. Several yes. I spent the night. <laughs> was it was it comfortable? Not really. No. You were so I want to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah. But it was lovely. And your mother? My mother, um, actually, she has the macular degeneration, but she has not gone completely blind or anything like that. But she finds it difficult to um, uh, to read and things like that. And she lives not very far away. She lives um, in the west of England with a view of the sea. <coughs> and, that, and I think she's quite happy, actually. Now. My father, of course, died, which you know. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. What is it or was it about being younger that made her so attractive to these individuals that she was so reticent to accept their affection and attention? It's a very good question. And uh, as you know, I met her when she was 103, so perhaps I'm not <laughs> the most qualified to answer. Um, it seems to me, though, even when she was 103, she had a certain freshness of expression. Um, that everything, seemed to, everything she said seemed to just bubble up rather spontaneously and precisely. And she was obviously quite fun because she did all these silly wild parties. Whether she was a great beauty, I think you would have to go back to the standards of beauty that um, applied in 1930. Because when I look at the photographs of her, she looks a little bit boyish and round-faced, gamine to me. I mean, not the sort of person I would have found terrifically attractive. But, well, I'm, I may well have found her attractive as a, as, as a character, but I wouldn't necessarily want, want to kiss her. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting myself in a mess here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm curious about the younger generation. Are we expecting them to carry on the family tradition with extraordinary literary <laughs> talents? Well, 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 someone's got to stop this at some point. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, one, one, one thing that does concern me is that my children um, ever get into their silly little heads that they failed if they don't don't do it or don't manage to do it. And actually, it's very difficult. Writing is a, is a jealous profession and a difficult <coughs> profession at the best of times. We're now in a, in a period where, where, where books are in, uh, under great stress and problems. I'm not saying that people aren't reading or that they're not buying electronic books and things like that. But what I am saying is that the, uh, the safety of author's royalty, which actually was always a problematic thing, because publishers were crooks, but there was way of there was a way of um, revealing their crookedness and stopping them. Uh, it's getting harder and harder and harder now because, in fact, the, the minute you write a book, it's all over the internet for free anyway. Um, I, I don't honestly believe it's, it, it's a profession that any serious, loving parent would recommend to their children. Um, so I, I would like it if my children grew up to enjoy books. I'd love it if they saw the thrill of Evelyn Moore and took little pride in it that I see in, in it. Um, but I, I would urge them to actually enter some profession that makes money. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>